to our last presentation from today and uh, now coming to uh, Nicky Coven and uh, he will talk about the design aspects of uh, river water, ammonia heat pumps for district heating. And uh, as said already, um, Mr. Coven has a, a degree in chemical engineering and he works in the oil and gas industry for three years, joined Star Refrigeration six years ago, started working on refrigeration and for the last five years, he has been helping the renewable energy division um, to deliver heat pump projects. Uh, good morning and uh, you have the floor, Nikki. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks to Thomas and Alexander for kind of covering the difficult bits on how a heat pump and uh, the kind of challenge we're facing around climate change and how heat pumps fit into that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to focus more on how the bits and bobs work and a heat pump. Um, oh, go back to the start. That would be nice. Hopefully, you can all see that. Super. Uh, yep. So great. Uh, there's three main things to making a river water ammonia heat pump for dish heating, and you probably guessed what the three things are from the name of that presentation. They are first that you need a river. They are second that you need a heat pump. And they are third, that you need something to heat. And that kind of sets up nicely for breaking a project like this down into its component parts. Yes, they're all extremely interlinked and all affect each other. But at the end of the day, we can tackle them individually to try and get the best outcome. So if we start with the water, it is river water, but we get two types of water. We get seawater and we get fresh water. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus more on the seawater aspect because it kind of has everything that fresh water has, but the chemical makeup of the water kind of likes to attack metal a bit more. So we have to start thinking about how we're going to get that water out. And there's three kind of main ways that I've came across. Open loop, closed loop and break loop. I'm sure someone will comment down a whole host of other ways you can do this. For what we're doing at STAR, we are doing open loop. Um, it's kind of, for us, the most challenging, but also gives the highest level of efficiency because that river water is coming direct straight into the evaporator. It is going into the tubes of the evaporator. So there's nothing blocking anything in between. Uh, we then have a closed loop system. And as I understand it, it's where you have uh, the outlet of the evaporator, pipe work keeps continuing into the river. There's a big kind of slinky of pipe in the river. You've got a glycol loop essentially and that's pumping around taking the heat out of the river bringing it back to the heat pump so it's a closed loop and then we have what we've seen is quite common called a break loop so that's where you're pumping the river water out you then have a, a heat exchanger separating the heat pump from the river water and then you have an additional glycol loop on the other side of the heat exchanger transferring clean liquid to the, the evaporator now, with the brake loop, you're going to get additional losses that you don't get over an open loop. Because you have that heat exchanger, you have heat transfer across it. So say the river water is at 5 degrees coming in, even if you've got a 2K approach, you're then only delivering 3 Kelvin, um, 3 degrees heat onto the evaporator. So you've lost some efficiency. So although open loop is more challenging, it's definitely the most efficient way to go. Um, these are some kind of typical questions that we get asked when we're talking about river water heat pumps. Are you sure you can use it? It's taken here, they're ever not bad for the, the things that live in it. What are we actually doing with the seawater? And yes, especially in Scotland, our rivers are cold, but because it's thermal energy, it's not just about the heat. So even down at five degrees, we can take heat out. So uh, everything's got some heat in it that you can take out. It's just how challenging is it? And is it worth taking the heat out? Um, it's taking heat out of the river, not, not bad. Um, the, the amount of heat that we're taking out is, is making such a negligible effect on the overall river temperature, especially big rivers, that it's not really an issue. We've had lots of conversations with the Environmental Protection Agency on appropriate amounts of heat to take out from things like rivers. Um, their kind of starting points for us is that three Kelvin temperature change, uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but about three Kelvin and 25% of Q95. Now the Q95 just means that 95% of the year, the river is above this flow rate. So it's a very conservative estimate that we need to start our kind of investigations on. Um, every situation is different, but that's that's our that's our good starting point. 
And what are we doing with the seawater? Well, this is the water that's going direct into the evaporator. So this is the fluid that we're using to boil off the ammonia and uh, complete the refrigeration cycle. So it's a, so it's a key important point for us. So other challenges, uh, location for where we're going to go, chemical composition, etc. cetera. Um, the, the location of where the heat pump's going is so crucial because it's a river. All rivers are different. Um, are they tidal? How deep is it? Do we need to go far out into the river? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of complications. One, one of the more interesting ones is who actually owns the bit of the river that you want to take the heat out of. Um, certainly challenges over the year. Uh, people like the Crown Estate who own it, they, they get quite interested and they want a share of uh, the heat sales and, and all things like that. So really important to, to get this information because it really determines what you're going to abstract from. Um, chemical composition, so said that we're mostly going to focus on seawater. And for that, we will always go evaporator on uh, titanium and evaporator tubes, titanium um, coated tube plates, super duplex end boxes as a bit of the system where you do not want to shy away from spending any money, um, especially for open loop. Um, so location, if it is tidal, um, you're going to have to place your filters in the river quite a bit lower. So that's obviously increasing your risk of extra filtration, mud, silt, sediment, uh, extra things that live in the bottom of the river are going to find their way into your system. So um, it's, it is really, really important. And one of the biggest things that we come across as a challenge is mussels, and not just the mussels, so mussel seeds, and these come in at 20 microns. So the, the filtration aspect that surrounds them is, is massive. There's a couple of different ways to do it. I'm going to show you one in this presentation that we've found out. But really, if you find this in the location, spend some time and effort um, thinking about how you're going to tackle that. This is our seawater PNID diagram of connections, we call it in STAR. And it's got the main bits of kit that we'll use before we get to the, the evaporator. So lots of filtration. Um, and we'll just work our way around this. So you have, to start off, these little filters down the bottom, the little baskets. And they're super important because this is the, the part of uh, the system that's first contact with the water. These are the bits that are in the water doing the, the, the first bit. So you have on these, these are self-cleaning back flushing filters. So what we're doing is we're pumping water up through these, and then we're going to send some water back down to them. And as you can see, there's about six nozzles on the side. So that, that water we pump back or push back down to this nozzle, it spins that arm in the middle round and the water jets out of them little nozzles so it cleans it and um, so it's still cleaning and one of the things we have to do in the UK is we have to comply with eel regulations so there is a big velocity restriction so the, the surface area has to be quite large I think it has to be less than 0.4 meters per second velocity into the system uh, because eels are endangered uh, so I think 95 percent of the population has disappeared over the years so it's, it's a very, very big um, concern that we have to take account for. So these are the first part of the system. So water comes in through these. We then have the suction lift pumps, which are next. That looks something like this. So different ways you can suck water into your heat pump system. This is a way that we've encountered so far. Um, so it's self priming abstraction pump. And that's because normally the river's down low and the land's a bit higher. Um, of course, you could build a pump chamber into the land and put your pumps lower, but this way has been easier so far. It has a vacuum pump on it. Because we have a height differential, we need to suck the water up to the starting point of the pump. That vacuum pump then switches off and then the main pump kicks in um, at variable speed. And I've got a note there because uh, theoretically, we've been told that you can lift it up to 10 meters, have the pump sitting 10 meters high above the river. The reality is when you start accounting for pressure drops and head and all the different flow rates, etc., it's about five to six meters we've found. Um, but you really want to get that pump as close as possible so it's not got as many kilowatts because you need to start accounting for that in your overall system losses. So we've got the filters which are first, then the pumps, and then we move on to start tackling some extra filtration requirements. So these little rectangles at the top of the PNID, and these are um, what we're going to be using for our next project as a way to stop the mussels coming in. So the first method we came across for stopping mussels was it was like spinning disc filtration, lots and lots of banks of filters, and 
for our project for I think it was about five megawatt water source heat pump. They were they're coming in at a couple hundred thousand pounds. With these, we looked at projects somewhere else. I think it was over in Berlin and Germany, actually. And uh, the guys were used to doing power stations. And they'd asked if we'd heard about this bit of kit. And um, it's just it's essentially just called muscle stop. And it's got a spinning drum in the middle. And to do something to do with the G-force of when that turns, and we're only talking about 10 RPM, uh, it's enough to sort of kill off the muscle larvae and the muscle seeds. And then there's pressure differentials. So there's a big basket filter in the middle, pressure differential switch trips. And then at that um, back washes back out and puts all that stuff back into the river. So this is a really, really good way to do it. It's a lot cheaper than the spinning discs. I think one of these will be thirty thousand as opposed to two hundred thousand. Um, so that was a that was a great find for us. Um, after you have some muscle stops, we then because we've got the river water going straight into the heat pump evaporator. I even know we've got the cell cleaner filters in the river, even though we've got an extra layer of filters stopping muscles coming in, we're super paranoid about having anything in the tubes that is going to be detrimental to the performance. And sediment and cells always going to make its way in. We then have an automatic tube cleaning system. And it looks kind of like this. So on the left hand side, we'll have the river water coming into the, the heat exchanger. And what we'll do is we'll inject some um, foam rubber balls into that main incoming stream that will carry the balls into the heat exchanger the heat exchanger pressure differential will pull the balls through the tubes the balls are slightly bigger than the tubes but they'll get compressed a little bit and they'll just kind of wipe themselves along the inside of the tubes getting all the dirt out they'll then come to the y type strainer at the end there's a kind of mesh screen in there which diverts the balls back down into the the pump skid and then the river water continues out back into the river and um, this is just this is a great piece of kit, and it just essentially puts your fouling factor back to zero. Um, so yes, always increase your heat exchanger for extra fouling for what you're going to happen. But um, this this is this is going to help you keep optimum efficiency. And that's just some notes on it there. Um, stop stopping the biofilm, etc. So keep that in mind. So that's the river water side, and then we've got the the next bit of the system which is the heat pump and we've got some main bits on the heat pump motor that's the big spray chiller evaporator at the top oil separator compressor then at the other end of the skid we've got um special pressure heating systems we're always going to try put in a de-superheater condenser subcooler to maximize uh, the efficiency because heat pumps are all about efficiency and selling heat so you want the most emission most efficient heat pump to sell the most amount of heat if we go back to the evaporator to focus on it, it's a shell and tube. So we have the river water coming in, going through the tubes. We have the liquid ammonia getting pumped up to the top of the vessel, and there's a spray bar along the top. So we spray the ammonia onto the tubes, and that gets boiled off and sucked back into the compressor. Uh, the tubes are titanium. The tubes that we've used um, with our manufacturer, they've been internally and externally enhanced tubes. So they roll the tube out and then they press down on it and get this lovely shape. We were concerned, if you can see in the inside of the tube, because we're doing an open loop, there's all these little crevices and uh, we were quite concerned that stuff was going to build up and sit in there over time. But uh, that's that's the job of the balls from the automatic tube cleaning system is to, to wipe. It's going to open and contract all the way down, wiping everything out. So that's been, that's been really good. Uh, the motors, Air cooled. I heard um, questions being raised on the previous one about the air cooled motors. We will be using air cooled. Um, water cooled adds a level of complexity into the system that you either can solve because you have a use for the heat, or you just can't and you need to stick with air cooled. The, the other way to do it, if we have to go to that really big size, because inverters become a problem over about 1.25, 1.5 megawatts. So um, going to the water cooled, you can have a, a dry air cooler sitting on the roof and just reject the heat. Obviously, you want to find a use for the heat, but given the temperature it comes off of the air cooled motor, it is quite hard to find somewhere useful for it. Um, and this motor, for one of our recent projects, you can see that it's actually so big, it requires a motor on the back of the motor to spin a fan to bring some cooling in. Um, so, yeah, it would have been nice to capture the, the waste heat and do something with it, but this is just the, the way it goes sometimes. Um, 
Inverters will always try to use inverters. Uh, help stop the big inrush current as well. That's one of the main benefits of them, uh, especially in the projects we're seeing in the UK. People like to keep their 400 volt systems or 690 volt systems. And if you don't have an inverter, that, that current is, is going to be huge. It's probably shut down the, the town you're putting the heat pump in. But if you find that you don't need the inverter, if you have nice running conditions and it's stable, you can obviously control the compressor on its sides, but you can have some bypass contactors and use the inverter to start the system up, bypass it when you're in a steady state, and then you're not getting the losses from the inverter either. Uh, compressors. So for the projects we've done recently, we're using twin screw. Um, so these are Grasso machines and they're rated at 52. They've got some at 63 bar. So the 52 bar ones were limited to about 80, 81 degrees. Uh, 63 bar lets us go up a bit higher. We have used single screws. So I don't know if you're familiar with STARS project in DRAM in Norway that uses a single screw type compressor. Um, we've had experience with semi-hermetic uh, style ones for our air source heat pump. And uh, we've not used pistons for our heat pump yet. We're hopeful that we can. It's one of the benefits of uh, STAR. We're not tied to any kind of compressor. So we, we'll just find what's best for the job. Uh, but pistons, we've kind of been limited. We're looking at higher temperature stuff. And we've seen that they need to go two stage. I'm sure Alexander will disagree, but um, that's what we've seen so far. For the, for the hot side of the heat pump, um, as you've seen, so we've got the, the heat exchangers on the right hand side. So the, if we think of district heating, which was what we're trying to do, we might have 50 degree waters coming back. We'll put it through the subcooler, the condenser and the D superheater, and we'll put it through the oil cooler separately. Um, because the oil cooler is the most complicated part of the, the hot water side. Um, all these heat exchangers are plate and shell. They allow us to have the, the higher pressure rating. The dispute or condenser and subcooler are, are, are they're just sitting there um, being, being nice and putting the heat in. The oil temperature, um, for dish heating, we need to go really high temperature. So we're maybe discharging at about 110 degrees. So that 110 degrees oil, um, we need to cool down for the, the compressor. The twin screw has a lower oil on temperature, we've noticed, than what the single screws do. And it might be limited to 60 or 65 degrees. And for some dish heating systems, you might see that the water comes back at 73 or 75. So we need to find a way of dealing with that. Um, so we can either reject the heat through an air cooler again, just the portion you need for the oil cooler, or you can use some of the source water to cool it down. Uh, the oil cooler as well also has a problem because of the high wall temperature. Dish heating system has to have a chemical composition to suit this. So we're talking less than 40 ppm chloride content, um, a pH ideally between six and nine, um, up to ten and a half is okay. Uh, because this this just leads to to problems where you get build up on the plate, stress corrosion cracking on 316L. If you're not going to get that chemical composition to where you need to, you might have to switch to titanium plates, and then that's just additional um, costs that you don't really need. So the oil cooler is definitely where you want to pay your attention to on these high temperature dish heating systems. Um, so dish heating network itself has a really crucial part to play in terms of heat pump performance. It's the part where we're delivering the heat to people's homes and businesses. Um, the lower we make this temperature, the more efficient the heat pump is going to be. And we've had some problems, not problems, but challenges recently where People are trying to shoehorn a heat pump into what a boiler or a gas HP system was previously doing. And then they get a bit confused as to why a heat pump's not able to, to deliver 15 megawatts at 120 degrees. Heat pumps are not a boiler. Um, we, we need the flow temperature to suit the heat pump. And the lower we keep making that condensing temperature on the heat pump, you get for every degree about a percent and a half increase in COP. And that, that that's quite big. The other way to get a bonus from the dish heating network for your heat pump is on the subcooling. So that's increasing the delta T. So if we have 70 flow, instead of making it 50, can we make it down to 40? Is there any reason why we can't increase it or decrease the network temperature? Um, and then again, we need to be careful in the design for fluctuating return temperatures. You know, as everybody starts with good intentions of, well, my return temperature is going to be 55 degrees. Yep, definitely the oil cooler, but in reality, it will always go higher. So Make sure you, 
you put a dose of reality into your systems as well. And finally, for heat pumps, not only are they cool because they cool rivers down and everything, and, and we can do additional heating, if you find a way, so what we're doing, because we're cooling the river down, if you've got five degrees and then two degrees off, if you can find somewhere to utilize that two degrees, you've made a cool stream. So why not use that to do some cooling? Uh, if you've got a hospital nearby or a data center, capture the waste heat from that and tie it together. Because if you're selling heat, your heat pump's got a COP of three on the heating, you're then going to have a COP of two in the cooling. So instead of only getting three units of heat sales, you're then tying in two units of cool sales. So you're getting five units of sales for your one unit of electricity. And uh, that, that's where things start to really get exciting um, in terms of investment. You can then start including for thermal storage. And again, this, this, is, this is great. The UK, and I'm not sure um, how much it is in other places, but we have a flexible half hourly sort of tariff system that's cheaper off peak times, more expensive on peak times. You can really play the system to having a big thermal buffer store, fill up with heat, run this, uh, the heat pump full 100%, switch the heat pump off, use the thermal store when it's maximum electricity prices, bring the heat pump back on when it's lower electricity prices, and really just take advantage of that. And uh, last comment is that if they're in the UK, they've extended the deadline for RHI for another year. So if you're considering doing projects, now is the time to do it. Because um, in, in two years, it's going to be harder if things haven't changed, and certainly in the landscape of electricity prices, and if gas is still cheap. So really, really push to get these in now. So that's the end of that. I hope um, that was all right for everyone. Uh, some details there if you've got any questions to send on to me after the end of the, the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Nikki, for your presentation. <clears throat> Indeed, we have a few questions uh, in the chat function. And um, the first question comes from Gerd Nielsen. He asking also the freezing temperature makes using the break loop harder to use than the open loop. Have you examined the pressure losses due to filtration resulting in an extra pump work which cancel um, out the efficiency gain of the open loop? So I should have specified before this started that uh, Gert was not allowed to ask questions because he's a very smart man. Um, no, uh, the, the, so the filters in the river, because they're self-cleaning, the pressure drops extremely low. The self-cleaning filters uh, trigger after a while. The, the, the overall pressure drop on the cold side isn't that high. Um, the freezing temperature of seawater is obviously great because it freezes below zero. Um, yeah, just reading the question. Pressure. Uh, but we're not really seeing any extra pump work. Um, it is a little bit, but it's it's fine. Um, I don't think we've not actually done a break loop system, uh, so I can't comment on the a true cost, uh, true pressure comparison. But um, we've not really noticed anything bad on the open loop systems. There's another question from Adam Strachan. Uh, he asking, is a self-cleaning process on the intake screen continuous or is it on a time-based basis? So on a timed basis, I think the default for these systems is every 20 minutes, but it comes with its own controller and you can set it to whenever you need. Um, so if you're super concerned every, every couple of minutes, but you can make it longer as well. Um, and it doesn't interrupt the, the process. So it's, it's real time cleaning. Mm -hmm. And Ian Bowman asking, will the cleaning boards wear over time, reducing their capacity to wipe and clean the, the surface? Yes, the balls will um, obviously wear over time and you'll replace them on a very yearly basis. But they're, they're a small expense, they're maybe 300 euros for a bag of uh, the balls. So um, you'll just it's just part of your, your normal maintenance. Now, the balls are all captured in, in the pot. You just take the balls out and put new balls in. It's quite straightforward. Okay. Here's a question from Matthias uh, Zafarik. Um, have you considered using a direct evaporation process for heat extraction uh, 718, like in the Aarhus project, which would avoid the river vaulting heat exchanger? So a DX evaporator instead of a river water heat exchanger? Uh, no, we haven't, as a, the simple answer to that. It's not something that came up in our thinking just now. Um, we're still just doing open loop water direct into the, the heat pump, but it's a good question. It's something for me to, to have a think about. So thanks, Ian. 
Okay. So Gerd Nielsen, how does Swimmer respond to the cooling of the cycle? Of the Clyde, so that's the River Clyde he's referring to in Glasgow, and uh, I don't think I've seen a single swimmer apart from when I've fallen off my rowing boat into the river and it's cold enough anyway. Uh, like I say, the, the temperature change I worked out for a two, we we're looking at doing a two and a half megawatt system. Um, so there's a there's a weir in the Clyde that separates the fresh water and the salt water, so it's a bit brackish, and the temperature change uh, was about 0 0.00053 degrees onto the river. So <laughs> if a swimmer can notice that, I would be super impressed. Yeah, I remember also heat pump in the um, Hamburg Harbor um, for the heating of um, an office building when they uh, also extracted um, the water directly from the harbor um, water. And there was some discussion about the minimum temperatures allowed uh, for the harbor water in this area. Not sure how much uh, recirculation you have uh, in in, the, in this area. So, because I mean, the, the rivers that we're talking about are they're, they're fast flowing. It's seawater, you know. So it's at the estuary or coming in um, before you know that there's not much recirculation because of the river flowing. It'd be different if you were doing it in like a a lock or a pond where there's no fresh water flowing to displace the water. Um, all the time, which is where I think on smaller heat pump projects, if you were doing um, lock water or pond water, you would maybe look at doing the, the cooling coil. Um, but you have to be very careful not to just take all the heat out and freeze it. I, I, I heard a project in Aachen. I'm not sure if it was realized or not to use the wastewater uh, of the city to uh, get uh, the heat of this. Have you ever realized or heard about th such projects? Yeah, I've heard about it. Um, the chap on First Thomas, his company, Kia, they've done a, a big one in Malmo. Um, we've we've looked into. It. We've not had the we've not had the challenge presented to us yet of tackling it. But I've seen I've seen it done, and um, it's so the the wastewater is typically higher temperature than the river water, so you're going to get a more efficient heat pump system out of it. But I guess uh, significant challenges uh, regarding pollution of the heating changes. Yeah, so you would. T uh, what I've seen is that you can put in if you're doing it direct that you put in macerators or um, one that we did look at was for a wastewater treatment plant in a town called Govan, just outside Glasgow, and we were going to take the heat at the point of the process where they were ejecting the water to the river anyway. So they'd done all their filtration and cleaning. The water was a higher temperature in the river by quite a few degrees. So. We were just going to jump in at the end after all the hard work had been done. But yes, you can do it in the middle of cities. It's a, it's a fantastic way to look at using that waste heat. Mm -hmm. There's another question which, uh, from, from Gerd Nielsen regarding how does swimmers respond to the cooling of the cycle? The use of uh, salt water is quite normal, but requires falling film evaporators. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if that's a comment or just Gerd showing off. Yeah. <laughs> There's another question coming in. Somebody is writing. Yeah, one of the challenges is wastewater treatment works require around 10 degrees C for the treatment to function so that you can only extract so much heat. Yeah, so if we're talking about pipes underground, um, obviously, I'm sure we all know and hear that Q equals MCP delta T. So we have a higher temperature. You're limited in the capacity that you can generate from the waste heat, depending on the flow rate that's also accompanying that at the 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. So the efficiency is the evaporation temperature is something that needs to be taken into consideration because that affects the efficiency. So even if we've got 10 degrees wastewater, if we have a really low flow rate, you're going to have to take more heat out to get a bigger capacity. So even if you get 10 degrees, if you're cooling it down to two, you're evaporating at zero degrees on a 2K approach across the evaporator. So in reality, your zero degrees evaporation temperature would be the same if you use the river. So mm -hmm. complexity of project has to be taken into account as well. But um, You see the question from Ian Bowman. It's interesting um, to, uh, to know that with district heating, oh shit, it's moving up. Um, this district heating, uh, we still find variable delta T causing efficiency issues. Incorrect delta T's have been the issues for years. How do you mitigate this? 
Yeah, obviously, Gert's pretty responsible as well. It's um, that is the most challenging bit is temperatures that you're told to design your heat pump on are in reality not what you're going to get, especially the higher return temperature. It's just something that you have to be thinking about from the start. How do you deal with it? Like I say, for the return temperatures onto the the oil cooler for the compressor, that that is the key bit. We can we can deal with higher temperatures coming off the heat pump, um, but yeah, it's it's all about preparing for the oil cooler. And yes, it does make the design more expensive. Um, you might have to have a go up a size in your your heat exchanger. Uh, you may have to have a lot more oil cooling. Um, so it's, it's something that, like I keep saying you have to take consideration at the, the start and have these conversations with the client because um, you don't want to be the one footing the bill for for building the heat pump. Okay. So Gerd Nielsen, the district heating in Bergen has managed to keep the return temperatures up at about 40 degrees C. Okay. Yep, yeah. uh, we've also seen that in Denmark, it seems to be quite good um, pressure and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a, the, the clients or the residents in the house have to ensure that they return a temperature that the district heating network wants. Um, we're quite new to district heating in the UK. Um, we're not as advanced with all these little catches and clauses and stuff. So uh, unfortunately, we just get back what we get back at the moment. Uh, I think that might be what happens in Denmark. I don't know if somebody from Denmark's in the call in the chat that can, can comment on that. It's not something I've seen in the UK. I, I don't know too much about the, the heat sales side of the district heat network. Okay, thanks, Gert. You, you see the question in the game? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. I think they do do that. I haven't seen that in the, the UK. But um, Skirt saying it's something that they do definitely do in other places in Europe. Mm -hmm. So Alexander is still uh, writing something. <clears throat> uh, here's a question from Karl Steinjahn. Uh, what is the minimum heating capacity at which such an open loop system um, make sense from an economic point of view? Um, extremely good question. And the answer to that is, is it's very situational. So I would say it'd have to be a couple of megawatts um, if, we're, if we're just doing it. Um, you really need to get the, the efficiency. So the bigger the machines are, the more efficient they start to become. Um, if you get that lower temperature on the dish heating side, it starts to really stack up. We're going to be doing one um, should be installed in the first quarter of next year, which is going to be 700 kilowatts. But I would say attached to that is some incentives from the government and uh, the renewable heat incentives. So just now we can do them down at that low capacity going forward. Um, I do really encourage big multi-megawatt systems to get the economics to, to stack up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, still two active participants. Uh, uh, Alexander Pachai uh, is talking also about um, the um, average return from the system about 40 degrees C, and there's a lot of savings for every degree you can lower, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that's you getting the, the efficiency bonus. I didn't want to go into the details in the presentation of pressure enthalpy graphs, but you essentially have your evaporation line and your condensing line, and the compressor is bridging that gap between the two and that's yep. where your cost going into the system is so for every degree you lower that condensing temperature you're reducing the amount of work to bridge that gap obviously you need to be the heat to be a useful temperature for people to use in their homes and showers and stuff but um and big big networks tend to need a bit more heat to, to keep the heat pushed all the way to the end but um yeah I keep bringing that down reducing the gap because we're talking about river water here that that lower line we have no control over it gets a bit hotter in summer and a bit colder in winter but the the heating line is definitely something that the client has control over if they're thinking about a heat pump then they need to think about the flow and return temperatures yeah so just a comment from get newton that, um, that the total yeah. costs are also uh, the, the distribution costs play a significant role eh? 
Um, yeah. No. Yeah, that is often something we say, that the heat pump's the easy bit, it's, it's getting the water and controlling the dish of heat, which is the hard bit. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's an interesting uh, presentation, an interesting topic, obviously. Uh, we get a, a lot of questions and comments, so people seem to be interesting into this field uh, in our uh, next uh, web seminar. It's not a webinar anymore, it's a web seminar. Um, we will uh, change the refrigerant and go from ammonia to CO2. So on, on I think it's a Monday um, at, at 8.30, we will continue. As a comment from Gerd uh, Nielsen in Folio outside Oslo, we have installed an air to water district heating system going from minus 15 to 90 delivery. That's pretty high. Uh, and, and uh, okay, so there will be separate email exchange on this topic. Yeah, um, we we will uh, hopefully hear everybody again on, on July 6 uh, on CO2 heat pumps. Uh, and we have two presentations, um, one presentation on, on the supermarket applications and the other is on um, the calculation simulation application of commercial and light industrial CO2 heat pumps. Um, and, and finally, we have three, I, I missed again one, and the CO2 heat pump water chiller. Uh, so three presentation on the 6th of July, 8.30, same location, and I would appreciate if you uh, have time to attend the meeting. Then I would like to close today's session. Thank you, everybody, and hear you back on next Monday. Bye-bye. Thanks.